Welcome to Under the Lens. Come and enjoy an extraordinary, raw, and unfiltered podcast that delivers debate, discussions, and interviews about film, pop culture, and everything in between. Here is your host, film critic and journalist, Byron Lafayette. Before we start today's podcast, I want to say that here at Under the Lens, I always like to have people from all spectrums and views join me to chat about their work and careers. I welcome everyone to come on and talk with me. That being said, sometimes that scares the suits upstairs who own this podcast, so they have requested me to read the following statement due to this interview touching on some political subjects. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the guest and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of Under the Lens, its parent company, Viral Hair, or its host. Now that we've gotten the legalese out of the way and the suits upstairs are happy, let's get into the guest for this podcast. Today I'm going to be speaking to New York Times bestselling author Larry Swicart. He holds a PhD in history from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and he is perhaps best known for his New York Times bestselling book, A Patriot's History of the United States. In 2020, Larry Swicart was appointed to the Board of Directors of the National Board for Education Sciences, which advises leaders of the Department of Education's Research Division. Today we're going to be talking about his career, how he started writing, and the process for writing A Patriot's History of the United States. So please join me in welcoming Larry Swicart to the program. I've written perhaps mm -hmm. 30 books, uh, either sole or co-authored. Uh, probably uh, 40 or 50 academic articles. I quit writing academic stuff about halfway into my academic career because I wanted to make money. Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> but the key to writing is to write mm -hmm. and to write all the time any for any venue, anything you can do to write because every aspect of writing hones your skills even more. So I, like you, I would write concert reviews. I'd write movie re reviews for anybody who would take them. Um, I once met William F. Buckley Jr. in uh, Santa Barbara as part of a group. I actually introduced him for his speech. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, so what's the secret to being a proficient writer? And he said, well, he said, I get up every morning, I brush my teeth, and I sit down at my typewriter and I write. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty much it. You, as a, if you want to be a writer, you have to write. You can't wait for the muse to move you or mm -hmm. for the right mood. No, the mood is when you sit down, you put your fingers on the keyboard and you write. Uh, that's it's absolutely it's it's absolutely true. I have a, a buddy of mine that he uh, he messaged me and he said like, oh, he's like, you know, he's like, I'm I'm working on like a novel. It was an idea that just came in, and he he said, you know, he's like, do you have a certain you know like you know, like word count, I should be writing every day and stuff. And I said, you know, I, I gave him a little bit of advice, but I told him, I said, well, I said, really, the truth of it is, I said, is not the amount. It's the fact that you do write every day. Right. <laughs> you know? exactly. it's like, I was like, even even if one day you're super busy, you can only get 50 words out. I was like, get those 50 words out and get in that habit. You know, it's like, well, and I think novel writing is probably, I know it is, I've written two novels and neither has been hugely successful, but I wanted to do it just to see if I could do it. Mm -hmm. And um, novel writing is different. Mm -hmm. I, in terms of my nonfiction, I have never in my life written an outline for a book. Mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. start writing the book. Um, with fiction, it's a little different because you need to know where your plot's going to go, where you're mm -hmm. going to have to drop Easter eggs or clues or, or misdirections or whatever it is. So you do need to kind of have an outline for that and for a screenplay, which is totally different than writing a screenplay for a documentary in a documentary you go where the evidence tells you to go um, uh, not counting the one done by those two women who wanted to show that Stephen Avery was innocent yeah. <laughs> they were going to go wherever they were going to go no matter what <laughs> don't mind that body over there <laughs> and we'll deal with that <laughs> oh that's funny <laughs> oh that's that's it's very that's very interesting because that that is that is true I've I've never you know um, cause I, I'm actually, I'm working on, on, um, on a book right now. It's a, it's about a TV. It was about a TV show that was canceled uh, back in the mid two thousands called Jericho. And it was yeah, this kind I of, like, that. 
Yeah, I loved that show so much. And I was kind of involved with like, you know, writ, you know, I wrote a lot of articles on it and everything. And so I, I recently decided, you know, um, last year, I was like, I'm going to write, you know, just kind of a book that has like commentary on episodes, a little bit of behind the scenes type stuff. So I've been working on on that. And uh, um Unfortunately, the uh, the um, the uh, actor strike right now has been affecting me because I wanted to get a bunch of interviews with the cast and I have to wait until that's over <laughs> until I can get those. So right now I've just been working on the episode commentary uh, with it to get that done. And that's hopefully going to be coming out uh, this uh, um, summer of 2024. Um, but um, but yeah, it's it's definitely it's you know, um, I know exactly what you're saying of that, you know, of just you can't wait until the feeling to write hits you. You just have to write, you know? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes right in the middle of while you're writing, you go, oh, okay, now I know where I'm going to go with this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so really that feeling, um, you know, the car's not going to go down the road till you turn it on and put it in gear. Mm -hmm. and, and so where you go from there is up to you, but you have to get it in gear and get it on the road. And uh, I just, I know too many writers who want to wait for motivation then the the opposite end of that is the perfectionist mm -hmm. who just uh oh, well i'm not happy with this you know well you've been at it for three years you know <laughs> when you, when you, so i'm a i'm a believer a lawyer once told me i was writing a short history of a law firm in dayton and he said my clients want an answer that's 99 percent correct today mm -hmm. rather than answer that's 100 percent correct tomorrow because they have to act on the best judgment of the law at that time and uh, i think that's that should apply to any writing you're better out better off turning out a book that's 99 percent good today than 100 percent right tomorrow because usually um tomorrow never comes i think that's yeah. the beatles song <laughs> oh i i definitely i agree oh, it's fascinating man well actually you know what that's a kind of a perfect transition with us talking about about writing that we can uh we can talk uh about patriots history um so what i'll what i'll do here um is uh i'll ask um i'm gonna um i'll pause about like five seconds here um for uh for editing purposes um and then what I'll do is um, uh, I'll uh, ask, what I'll do is I'll do kind of like an, an intro. Um, I'll record a separate intro kind of uh, before the podcast um, explaining like, you know, just like who you are as a guest and everything. And I'll, I'll at, attach that in um, later. But what I'll do is I'll jump right in and I'll ask you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, and you can give a little bit of your background um, uh, and such. And then um, then. I'll uh, introduce the, the book that we're going to be talking about, and then I'll jump in with the questions if that works okay. for you. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Let me uh, the thing here. Man, well, thank you for joining us uh, today, uh, Larry. You know, uh, could you uh, start us off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I was uh, born in Arizona. I'm a native Arizonian. Went to Arizona State University and got a degree in political science, which was the most useless piece of paper I ever had in my life. And then um, I'd been playing drums in various rock bands all the way through high school and college. And I immediately went on the road with a rock band, uh, first of many. Um, and over the next several years, we ended up getting fairly close to making it. We were opening for Steppenwolf, the James Gang, Savoy Brown. Um, and then for various reasons, the band just abruptly broke up and I came back to Phoenix and I thought I would uh, find a band here, but I wanted something during the day that would pay the bills. And I thought teaching would be an easy gig. And I already had a uh, BA in political science. So I thought I, it wouldn't be hard for me to get a teaching certificate. And in the context of doing that, they said, well, you need a history class. You didn't have a US history class when you graduated. So, okay. So I went back to school sometime around 76 and um, took this six week summer school course in US history. And the professor was so amazing and answered all the questions I had about political science that political science didn't answer. And within about a six week period, I said, I wanna be that guy. How do I be a professor? And so I um, enrolled in the graduate program in history at Arizona State and he it was only through his support I was able to get in because I had terrible grades because I <laughs> was playing rock and roll <laughs> and uh, then uh, 
after I got my master's in history from Arizona State, they did me a favor and they kicked me out. They said, uh, we can't get you a, a good enough job. We're not a big name university. You need to go to some someplace and get you a job. So I ended up at the University of California, Santa Barbara to get a PhD. And sure enough, my advisor got me a job on one phone call. Essentially, I ended up within a year after teaching in Wisconsin, I ended up at the University of Dayton in Ohio, where I stayed for the next 31 years. And about 15 of those years, I was writing academic articles and books because I believed them when they said publish or perish. If you want to survive, you need to publish. <clears throat> and then sometime in the mid to late 90s, I decided I want to write pop books or popular books that would, you know, appear in uh, bookstores and then later in Walmart, Target, places like that. So I started working on a history of the United States with Michael Allen, a guy I had met at a history convention earlier in the decade. And we were originally just going to write a book for us, for us to teach our classes in US history from, because we didn't like any of the books that were out there. And we didn't really think we'd get a publisher. We thought we'd have to bind it at FedEx or Kinko's and sell it out of the back of a van like other contraband <laughs> items, you know, <laughs> like plastic straws in California. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> plastic straw. Patriots history of the United States. <laughs> so, but we did get a publisher, and in 2004, Patriots history of the United States came out, and it did really well. I mean, we were I got interviewed by Rush Limbaugh on uh, for his Limbaugh letter, uh, interviewed by um, or reviewed by Claremont Review of Books, Wall Street Journal, even the New York Times reviewed it. They didn't like it, but they reviewed it. And um, so it settled into making steady money and being a favorite of homeschoolers. And so I was into the trade publishing business. Mm -hmm. And as a result, over the next few years, I wrote several books on other topics, mm -hmm. uh, including one called 48 Liberal Lies that you probably learn in school. And uh, I was on Fox and Friends. I was doing a regular segment by about 2008 called The Trouble with Textbooks, where I would take a current textbook and read something stupid out of it and then show you <laughs> how it was wrong. And I get this call and the guy goes, this is Harlan Crow, Dallas, Texas. I later figured out it was Crammel Crow Holdings. This is the guy who recently was accused of bankrolling Justice Clarence Thomas, right? <laughs> and, so, and he goes, I, I won't give a copy of your book to every legislator. And I thought, oh, 435, 535 copies, yay. He goes, no, <laughs> I want to give a copy to every legislator in America. And I thought he was like a nut. I go, well, you know, that could cost some money. So yeah. how much do you think $100,000 will get us? I said, well, I'm happy to do it, sir. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so he bought 7,680 copies hardcover of that book. And we, I autographed them and sent them to every legislator in America. So... Patriots history was just kind of rambling on, wasn't fantastic, but it was doing okay. And then in 2010, I was on the Glenn Beck show when Glenn had five and a, three and a half million nightly viewers. He had more viewers than Tucker Carlson did when he left Fox. And uh, I gave him a copy of Patriots history and he goes, well, I know this book. Do I know this book? And well, no, Glenn, you obviously don't know it because the proper response is, this is a great book. <laughs> so, so he called me five days later and he said, Larry, when you were on the show, I hadn't read your book. I said, well, I know, Glenn, that's okay. He says, no, no, this is a great book. <laughs> and so starting the next week, I'm getting calls and, and emails and everything. People are like, Glenn's talking about your book. Glenn's talking about that. And he, for, for two weeks, he did nothing but talk about Patriots history. He held it up every night, four or five times. He kept it on his desk with only the 5,000-year uh, leap by Scouts and those two are the only books on his desk that people could see. It was probably a million dollars of free advertising. <laughs> and we immediately shot to the top of the New York Times charts, which, you know, as a writer, you could appreciate that a six-year-old book making it onto the New York Times list is pretty amazing. Very and much so. so. <laughs> then I get the call uh, first week from the publisher and they go, hey, Larry, your book's going to be on the New York Times list. I go, wow, that's great. Wonderful. Next week, I get the call. Your book's going to be in the top 10. I go, wow, that's wonderful. Great. Then I get the call and I can hear him on speakerphone partying in the background. 
<laughs> and uh, they say, Larry, your book's going to be number one on the New York Times list. I said, well, that's good. That's great. No, you don't get it. It's going to be number one. It's going to be in Target. It's going to be in Costco. It's going to be in Walmart. I said, wait a minute. Our book's going to be in Walmart. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> because that meant that Mike and I were finally reaching ordinary people, regular readers who we wanted to reach with this book. And it stayed at the top of the chart for almost a, a full month. The, the book, if you've seen it, it's a thousand pages um, of nonfiction. That doesn't happen very often. Yeah, no, that's very that's very true. Yeah, actually, I have it right here on my desk. And yeah, it, it definitely it's 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 it, uh, what do they call it? It's a tome, you know, yeah, a weighty tome is the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you know, one thing that I've I appreciated, you know, very much about the book is I, I love the way it's laid out, you know, because, you know, with a lot of books that are this big, you know, a lot of people feel like, oh, man, I don't have the time to sit down and, you know, read, you know, a thousand page book. But the way it's laid out, it's so easy to be able to just jump in at any point, you know, right. with different different aspects of history, you know, and read, you know, a few chapters or a few sections, you know, on it. Uh, that it was, uh, it was 2000 pages when we turned it into the publisher. And uh, in addition to chopping half the book, they said, you need to put headers in here. Uh, subheaders that will allow people to kind of have a roadmap as to where you're going. But regularly, I attend homeschool conventions, and we've turned this into a curriculum for high schoolers, and it, it, it is the reading book. It is the spine for the course, and I'm getting these eighth graders come up. Oh, I read your book. I love your book, and you know, high schoolers. So um, anybody looking at the book, don't be intimidated. I regularly have high school kids reading this, and they, they love it. <laughs> Oh, you no, know, it's yeah, definitely. I can I can attest. It's a very it's a very easy read. You know, um, everything everything flows really, really well. And, you know, like I said, I love being able to just jump into certain areas, you know, and, and eras of American history and just kind of explore, you know, what was what was going on during that time. Well, How, my uh, very favorite part, you got to jump in. If you haven't seen, gotten to it yet is my discussion of Woodstock. I wrote the section on Woodstock and that's probably my favorite part of the book. <laughs> I'm going to have to jump in there and read and read that portion. <laughs> oh, how, uh, how long did it take you and Michael to, uh, to write it uh, from when you started to when you, when you finished? Well, uh, it, probably about four years. Um, you have to remember that we were both long tenured professors at that time. And we had written a lot of other books. And so it, it wasn't that we were starting from scratch. We could draw from all this other stuff we had written. It wasn't quite cut and paste, but there were times that I could literally take a few paragraphs out of something I had written somewhere else, just basically revise it a little bit, and that would make up the new section. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so maybe um, four years, but I think the most amazing thing about writing the book was that I had met Michael at the western historical conference around 1990 or 91 and i hadn't physically in person met with him again until after the book came out we wrote the whole book by email and phone that's incredible <laughs> that's that's amazing you know and and it kind of it just goes to show you know uh you know what good writers you guys are to be to you know to be able to put together a book you know over long distance you know because not everybody can do that that's that's amazing <laughs> well it, it's kind of um what they used to say about clint eastwood as a uh director it, you know one shot clint i mean he would prepare and prepare and prepare and then all he was going to do is one take and and um I thought that th there's a lot in this. When when we did our our movie Rock and the Wall in 2010, Mark Leaf and I, the director, we spent off and on most of a year before we ever shot anything talking about what we were going to shoot, how we were going to shoot, who was going to be involved. And so when you do the the preparation, it's like a good baker. Uh, a good baker, it's all done when it goes into the oven. If you've done it right, it's only a matter of setting the timer. And um, so I would urge people when you're getting ready to either write a book or make a movie, uh, do the preparation and then the, the writing or the filming will be just gravy. It's easy.
That's very, it's very true. Yeah. Preparation is, is everything when it comes to something like this. Now, you know, with the, uh, you know, the title, the title of the book obviously is a Patriot's history of the United States. Um, you know, can you tell me and an audience, you know, uh, what made you choose the title, um, a Patriot's history and, and what does that, that mean in relation to, to the book? <laughs> the editor chose it <laughs> <laughs> and our original working title was the cup of hope. Mm. a patriot's history of the united states in other words something that a patriot would write mm. and uh when the editor got it she said a wonderful woman named bernadette malone Serton, and she said oh you're burying the lead this needs to be the lead and contrary to what most people who know anything about us or howard zinn uh think we did not write this directly to challenge howard zinn's people's history of the United States. Um, that, that never crossed our mind. I barely knew who Zinn was when we were writing the book. We were more interested in, as I said before, producing a book that we could use in our instruction in classes. Mm. That's fast. That's fascinating. You know, and have you, have you encountered, you know, have you, you know, having, having written, you know, this book and how, how successful it's been, you know, like you said, being on the New York times and, and you know, being in the the Limbaugh letter and everything, have you have you encountered any like resistance or blowback to this to this history of the United States? Well, of course, but I don't read critics ever. I have never read what a critic, with one exception, and that is the very first review on Amazon was written by a guy named Dave Doherty. At the time, they told you who the reviewer was, and he said they a. a uh, forget what is it an excellent book but not without its flaws and i thought what the hell are these flaws <laughs> and, and so i he had an email in there and i emailed him and and he told me a few and i go hmm that's that's concerning they weren't all errors of fact but he enlightened my interpretation on a few things and so mike and i paid him a small fee to go through the whole book i said i want you to list every single thing you think is wrong in this book and so he sent me 14 pages <laughs> and but again most of them weren't factual errors most of them were well you say this but really i think you need to consider this and it made the book much much stronger so um i don't read the other critics i don't really care what they have to say i know what the leftists are going to say they're not going to read the book almost any leftist that complains has never read the book um and uh, the people who are on our side who read it well uh, they're just going to agree with me so I, I really don't pay attention <laughs> to critics mm -hmm. uh, one way or another mm -hmm. well i think that's probably that's probably a smart a smart decision you know uh you know as a as a writer because you know you can get kind of bogged down you know if you're listening too much to to the negativity uh you know and that can affect your your writing so i think that's probably a smart a smart decision um you know, as you know, obviously somebody who is, you know, a professor, you know, and, you know, obviously written a history book. Uh, why do you believe that, you know, knowing history, studying history uh, is so important for a society? Well, first of all, uh, there's there's the old line, um, I think it's by Ortega y Gasset, those who haven't studied the past are doomed to relive it or something like that. But uh, beyond that, we provide, thanks to my background in government and Mike's background in, in culture and music and a lot of other things, I think we provide, in essence, a, a very solid background in American government and the American economy in the course of teaching history. History is the vehicle that allows you to analyze larger truths about uh, government and freedom division of powers, political parties, things like that, or the economy, you know, what constitutes the value of money? What's, uh, what is capitalism? What is socialism? Um, so history is um, an ongoing vehicle to learn truths about the past, which is why the modern wackadoodles are out there so desperately trying to kill history because they don't believe in truth mm. uh, and if you can take out history you can do a pretty good job of assaulting truth mm. 
That's very fascinating because I remember uh, uh, in my one of my college classes, uh, I believe it was a I can't remember the exact class. I, I think it might have been a might have been a philosophy class. I remember my professor, he stood up and he he said, uh, you know, he asked a question where he basically just said, how many of you believe, you know, and he gave a statement of, you know, it was some, some type of ethical type uh, question. You know, and I would say about like probably three quarters of the class, you know, raised their hand, you know, that they believed this. And then he said, you know, he said, oh, he said, you know, I want to let you know that that, you know, viewpoint that you have, he said, was, you know, written by and he gave, you know, the name of philosopher from, you know, the ancient Greece. And he said, you know, he said, your your worldview, he said, your views have been framed by somebody who lived, you know. Yeah. 2,500 years ago. Right. And he's like, you've never heard his name before today. <laughs> That's funny. You know, I had a, uh, I went to school right during the end of the Vietnam War. I went to college from 68 to 72. And um, so there was a lot of student protesting going on on campus. And I had the uh, unfortunate experience of getting a philosophy class with a professor named Morris Starsky, who was always in trouble for, uh, you know, bucking the administration and doing uh, war protests and that sort of stuff. So I remember one time he told the class, there's going to be a big protest out there on Wednesday and you need to, everyone needs to be out there. So I came to his class on Wednesday and almost nobody else was there. And he was upset. He's going, why is anybody here? I said, well, you told them all to go to the protest. <laughs> it's like Abby Hoffman wrote this book called Steal This Book. Uh -huh. And then he was shocked when people actually stole the book, you know. <laughs> Words have meanings and, and ideas matter. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the biggest problems with um, society today and politics today is that people don't understand that words have meaning and, and politics matter. So if you're Kevin McCarthy and you make a promise to the House Republican caucus that you won't support any more Ukraine aid and that you will abide by a decision to vacate the chair. In other words, if I don't keep my promise to you, you can kick me out with one, but one guy can kick me out. And then he's shocked when one guy kicks him out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's so, it, it's so true that, you know, you, when you, when you make those statements, when you make those, you know, um, those things, they're on the record. And then it's like, yeah, you, you can't be surprised when people remember it, you know? Well, today, of course, you can't get away with anything because mm -hmm. everything is on the record some places, mm -hmm. social media and so forth. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, with, with um, Patriot's history, you know, one of the first things we said in our introduction was that, there's no such thing as objective truth for humans because every fact, uh, everything that we know as truth is a collection of facts and the selection of this fact over another is a value judgment. Mm -hmm. And and so if, if I've got 10 different facts, I'm gonna tell the story about the Custer massacre, mm -hmm. I can rely on 10 facts from people from Custer's command who watched from a distance but could barely see anything, or I could rely on 10 facts from Indians who had an oral tradition, which in itself has all sorts of problems mm -hmm. because an oral tradition sometimes requires you to approach things with bias, mm -hmm. such as the more cavalry you killed, the better it looks for you. So you might say, well, I killed 20 guys and, you know, or an alternative oral tradition is that the more that they killed of you, but you survived, it makes you look even better. So yeah, we lost 200 braves in that attack, but I survived and I took out 15 soldiers. So these kinds of traditions, it depends on where you're getting your facts from, but you always have to understand that no matter how honest you want to appear in presenting the facts, your bias will play a role and there is no way you can get rid of your bias. If you actively try, to overcome your bias as the leftists did after World War II with their, their books on the Cold War, you end up presenting a whole new type of bias, which is to say a, a lie. So uh, as we said in the introduction of Patriot's history, um, uh, we don't believe in um, my country right or wrong, but we do believe, we do believe that my country always wrong is, is not acceptable. Hmm. 
you know, that's I think that that's very true because you know you know that's what you know I've I've always believed uh, something very similar to that you know and that you know you have when you look at history when you look at what you know a country has done you know like you said you you can't really look at it with those blinders because like you said there's bias there's there's you know what do they say hindsight is 2020 you know it's like you know when when you look back and you know i i've always very much enjoyed you know uh you know reading history and everything and you know i feel like you know i i used to read a lot about the you know the british empire you know and and it's so fascinating of of looking back and just seeing you know all of the things that you know that that seemed you know right or wrong or whatever but you have to learn from what they did without that actual bias so i'm, I'm i think it's fascinating that you you went with that direction with this book and i think it i think it really worked honestly in my opinion well you can look at anything written by churchill for example his histories of world war ii and <laughs> needless to say it's a very pro-british history that paints <laughs> england in a, in a very very good light mm -hmm. but um so i'll give you an example just recently i was down in savannah georgia for the william tell top gun flight exercises this was air to air combat simulated combat by real pilots flying f-22s f-36s and f-35s and f-16s and um um one of the people honored at this event was a colonel named james harvey a, a black member of the tuskegee airmen whose unit had actually won the William Tell Top Gun event in 1949, flying P-47 Thunderbolt, Thunderbolts. And um, the Air Force refused to recognize their victory in the games. And they said, no winner. No oh, winner in the 1949 Top Gun contest. So they finally corrected that in 1998 and, um, and honored him. Um, so one way to look at that is, isn't that terrible? America's so racist and, and, and so, um, uh, segregationist and, and so anti-black. It took them till 1998 to recognize this. Well, yeah, that, that's true. That's all true. But another way to look at this is in World War II, we had black pilots flying and escorting white bombers who put their lives in the hands of those black fighter pilots and a comparable thing would be how many jewish fighter squadrons do you think hitler had i would say probably zero exactly <laughs> exactly how many uh entrepreneurial capitalist fighter squadrons do you think uncle joe stalin had in the red air force I would I would say zero. Yeah, that would be zero. So <laughs> there's two ways you can look at this. And one is, uh, yes, at the time this happened, this was uh, terrible. It was a, a gross oversight. It was an injustice. Mm -hmm. A, it was corrected later. Mm -hmm. But B, the very fact that they were even in the position to do that mm -hmm. says a great deal about our country mm -hmm. that you can't say about any other country at the time you know people talk about american imperialism and we took the philippines and we held them to world war ii well that's true we also set up a plan for the liberation of the philippines very very early but how many people know that as a result of that same spanish-american war we conquered cuba we should have cuba as a state right now but we didn't why because we immediately passed a law the Teller Amendment that said that the United States had to evacuate Cuba within five years and hand it back over to the Cuban people or whoever else was going to take over, but it wasn't going to be us. And I've looked through all of history and I cannot find one other example of any empire in human history that voluntarily freed a piece of territory, a people that it had conquered in war. That is fascinating. I did not know that about uh, about Cuba. That's very interesting. <laughs> I mean, uh, you people want Puerto Rico to be a state now, but uh, I imagine <laughs> if Cuba was a state, uh, Donald Trump would get two more electoral votes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, that that's very true, and, and man, there there would be a, a whole nother uh, 
basically resort island like Hawaii. <laughs> you know? Well, that's interesting because when Trump uh, met with Kim Jong Un over there in Korea, mm -hmm. he pitched him on turning Korea into a resort. Yeah, you know, you've got really good coasts here. You could put up great, great resorts here. I could help you build the biggest resorts in the world right here. <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. I did not know that. <laughs> oh, that is really that is really funny. Oh, oh, and I mean, you know, that 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 is true about North Korea. They do have some great coastal areas there. <laughs> A little bit cold for my taste. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> It'd have to be uh, resorts like um, what is it? They have to be like the ones you see in like Switzerland or something, you right. know. <laughs> Chateaus. Oh. Uh, yeah, you know, there was a there was one thing in the Patriots history that I uh, that I ran across that uh, that I found really interesting, and it was a uh, I believe it was in the conclusion uh, that you mentioned a video game magazine that ran a, a picture oh, yeah. that depicted Iwo Jima, and so I was wondering if you could expound a little bit on that. <laughs> okay, so there was a, a video game that um, showed Japanese raising the rising sun at Mount Suribachi. Uh, recreating the famous uh, scene that has now become a statue and is, is very well known, the Americans raising the flag, was made into the movie Flags of Our Fathers by Clint Eastwood. And, and the tagline said, history is in your hands, don't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> and that reminds us all that history isn't set. Now, if you're a Christian, obviously you believe there is an end of history coming. It's going to come in a certain way. But up until that particular time, history isn't set. And every time you think you know how things are going to turn out, um, they seem to go a different direction. There's an old joke that says, uh, you know, if you want a good laugh, tell God your plans. <laughs> oh that that is true and i think you know it's it's interesting of just kind of seeing you know just how how society has changed like you said with how how people communicate with how you know news is reported you know with all this different stuff that makes that makes control by you know by you know a elitist group of some sort it would make it a challenge you know um well it is and um we, we've gone from having virtually all news and media controlled by five outlets in the early 80s, which would be ABC, CBS, NBC, Washington Post, New York Times. Basically, any news that was news had to come through those filters first. And then what would the arrival of um, the Washington Times, it was the first one to break through that monopoly, and then Rush Limbaugh in 1988, and then Fox News in the mid-90s, um, and then, of course, the Internet by the early 2000s, you you broke this monopoly on news. And although they are still very powerful in the way they can censor people and and uh, cancel people, I got booted off Twitter during the election of 2020 for using the word fraud. I had one hundred and thirty five thousand people when they kicked me off. Uh, but good old Elon brought me back. But um, they haven't totally been able to control the flow of information. So now we have kind of the opposite problem, which is that we've got so much information out there, figuring out what is true uh, is now a little harder than it was say um, seven or eight years ago, 10 years ago. Um, when, when you had kind of a sweet spot between the counter media and the old traditional media. And, and now I think the new media is pretty much taken over and obviously whether it's subscription rates and and numbers or viewer rates uh, fox abc cbs msnbc they can't come anywhere near to what people uh what networks did back in back in the day i mean the um the presidential debates used to get 25 million people watching Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, and they don't hit anywhere near those numbers now. No, close. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think I, I was told I haven't validated this. I was told that the, the most watched debate was actually the one between Ronald Reagan and, and Bobby Kennedy back around 1968, just before he died. 
and, and that ultimately that had more views than almost any other presidential debate ever. And that wasn't a presidential debate. That's inc- that's incredible. Oh, and it, I think, you know, because it's 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 interesting because, you know, there used to be, you know, kind of like what you were saying, you know, with the with the network news, with everything that that people all went to get their news from certain you know areas and certain places where like now it's so decentralized with different stuff, because, you know, I mean, just a, a recent example that I can think of, of you know, with the uh, um, with the whole war going on right now in the Middle East, you know, um, with Israel and Gaza that I find like a lot of the news that I follow is not necessarily, you know, from the the networks, you know, that there's, that there's some more small time journalists who I follow who are, you know, on the ground and they're posting, you know, videos of them, you know, in, in the region, you know, talking about it, interviewing, you know, people there, you know, and a lot of these people are, you know, probably, you know, people the vast majority have never heard of, you know, they have their following, of course, you know, but, uh, um, you know, but they're, they're more like, you know, um, you know, I don't want to say citizen journalists because they're they are actually like journalists, but um, but they're much smaller time than they're not uh, backed by some big media corp. Exactly, yeah. In, independent journalists would probably be the 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 way to say it. Um, yeah, and you know, you know it's, it's, there's two factors there that are interesting. One is I follow a group called the Duran. It's two guys named Alexander, 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 and uh, uh, <laughs> they have been very good on Ukraine. Um, and they speak, you know, the Slavic languages and so forth. And so, and they travel uh, quite frequently to these areas. And um, <clears throat> they were saying the other day that that Ukraine and uh, Israel Gaza are two different things. They're totally opposite. That in Ukraine, the amount of information coming out was minuscule, and it was really hard to get any information at all because both the Ukrainians and the Russians for their own independent reasons were locking down information. And they said here in Gaza and with Israel, it's just the opposite problem. You have too much information. There's just so much out there that sifting through this to try to figure out what's really going on is is the, the trick. The other point I would make here is that I'm currently working on an updated version of Patriot's history. Now, the book is in its 41st printing and it's it's gone through five editions but the publisher doesn't want to do any new edition so i decided for the purposes of our homeschoolers and all the people who use this as a textbook mm-hmm. i hated it back in school when somebody get you up to like the 60s and say but you've lived through all that so you, you know you know all the rest well, <laughs> i'm sorry you know i was like 10 years old in 1960. so um i'm writing an updated version of this and one thing that's very hard in updating a book like this is perspective seeing the forest for the trees um and and the whole thing about uh significance which is what drives every history um people say well why do you write about dead white males i go well because they were the most significant people how how dare you say that well let's talk what is significant significance is that which affects the largest number of people over time so a slave or a day labor, you know, in, in the Middle Ages or um, a, a, a boot maker in medieval times or somebody working in Carnegie's mills uh, would have had almost no significance. I don't mean to demean them as a person. What I am saying is their ability to affect large numbers of people over time is absolutely nothing. If if 20 of them died in a mill accident, very, very little in history would have changed. And you can always make the argument, well, what if they gave birth to a Einstein? Yeah, of course, you can't argue that. But nevertheless, given trends in general, uh, the way things generally go, uh, Carnegie personally was more significant than every single person who ever worked at the Carnegie Steel Mills put together because of the way he changed the large number of people's lives over time. So writing an update to Patriot's history is extremely difficult, not because I don't have any information, but because I'm drowning in it. <laughs> no, that's very true of like deciding, yeah, what what are you going to include? What is the most significant? I can, I can imagine that would be quite a daunting task, uh, you know, especially, you know, with the, you know, with, I mean, just over the last, 
you know, 10 years itself. So much has happened. So many figures have popped up and disappeared and new ones have come up. So you're constantly stuck with, all right, how important is this person? How, how much do we, you know? And that kind of goes with having to have this broad picture of history that can be difficult when you're when you're in the point when history is being made, I can imagine that would be that would be difficult of of distinguishing, you know, who to include in a, in a narrative. So definitely uh, not a task that I envy. When you're writing a history like Patriots history, um, <clears throat> to me, there's three things you need to include in almost every section. I mean, besides obviously the chronological details, I think you need to include a person and focus almost every unit or section on one or a group of people because readers can identify with a person, but they can't necessarily identify with a cause or, I mean, who the hell knows about 16 and a half to one <laughs> in silver, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or um, 54, 40 or five, what does that have to mean to any of us today? But people can and are interested in, can get into somebody like Daniel Boone or um, uh, you know Calvin Coolidge, who was so noted for saying so little that he was known as Silent Cal. And in one dinner party, a woman sat next to him and says, Mr. President, I bet you I can get you to say more than two words. <laughs> Coolidge said, you lose. <laughs> so you need to tell a story involving some, a person or some people. Number two, you need sufficient lower level detail that fleshes it out. And I'm reading a book now by a guy named John McManus called To the End of the Earth. It's a third part of a trilogy on the U.S. Army in World War II. And he's very good and, and he is really adept at this detail. But he just he seems to lose the momentum sometimes with all this detail. Where a similar book by a guy named Ian Toll a trilogy about the Navy in the Pacific in World War II, he would drench you in this detail and then lead you out of it just like you were coming out of a shower. So you need to have uh, people, you need to have sufficient uh, detail, and, and then you have to always keep in mind a, uh, uh, a broader theme. Where is this heading? What's this saying? How does this person relate to your broader paint strokes or brush strokes about the overall history of America. Mm -hmm. This is very, very true. If you could summarize, uh, in your opinion, why somebody should read a Patriot's history of the United States, uh, what would that be? People should read it because you need to know your past. You need to know why the country looks the way it looks and acts the way it does and whether or not the current look or actions are faithful to the reasons the country was founded in the first place. Um, as I said, if, if you read Patriots history, you'll come out with a very good economics education and a very good education in government. Uh, as I said, I went to, to school for four years and, and got a political science degree, and it didn't answer any of the questions I had about American politics. Why are there two parties and really only two parties? Uh, why do third parties fail? Why do the parties gravitate toward the middle? Uh, things like that. Um, why, why is change so slow in Washington, D.C.? And um, in, in Patriots History of the United States, we answer all those questions in the course of history. You can see why these things are the way they are. Uh -huh. That's excellent. And, you know, I can definitely I can definitely say to everybody listening, you know, definitely check out uh, Patriots History of the United States. It's a very, very interesting book. Uh, it's very easy to read. And if you have any interest at all in American history, uh, history in general, uh, it, you definitely owe it to yourself to to check out. Um, you know, it's uh, it's on sale on Amazon, wherever books are sold. Uh, you know, I picked up my copy at a uh, at a convention. Uh, but um, but definitely definitely check it out. You know we developed this curriculum, and the curriculum is found at the wildworldofhistory.com, and it's a full high school curriculum in U.S. history, and then we have a year-long curriculum in world history, and the U.S. uses Patriots History of the United States 
So I have it there at conventions selling the books when I'm selling the curriculum. And I can go around and I can probably find seven or eight other vendors who are selling uh, Patriots History of the United States. I'll also alert your uh, listeners to the fact that if you want more history, I have a VIP subscription at $69 a year for um, the wild world of history. And in that, I have on I have these ongoing lesson programs like Reagan, the American president that has about 21 videos. I have the 1620 default, why the 1619 project is wrong. That's about 11 videos. Uh, I'm just adding a new one called Integrity on uh, the life of Winston Churchill. Um, but also free. Uh, currently, I've been reading A Patriot's History of the United States from beginning to end, and we, we're just up into chapter six on Jackson, and there's uh, 72 free videos on YouTube at the Wild World of History channel, where I'm just reading through, and every time we come to a document like the Articles of Confederation or Washington's uh, letter on forming a peacetime military, I read the whole original document as well. So. It's a little different than a, a narrated book on um, Audible or something, but it's uh, it contains a lot more information. That's excellent to hear. Uh, I'll definitely check out those uh, those videos because that's 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 very cool. I love the interactive nature uh, of you reading it and showing off the the different documents. That's very cool. <laughs> yes, and and some of these documents are pretty long and need a little bit of interpretation as you read because back then well they wrote longer sentences some people had a longer attention span <laughs> and i will read a, a whole paragraph and go gee that was one sentence <laughs> <laughs> oh. now uh where can uh where can people find you larry on uh on like social media or i know you mentioned some websites already um where can people follow you for your work <laughs> okay so the history work is at wildworldofhistory.com uh, for my political commentary, I do political commentary three days a week at the wildworldofpolitics.com. And we have an insider there that has additional videos that are not on the history side. Um, on Twitter, I am at Larry Swikart. So capital L, capital S. If you spell my name right, you'll find me there. I also am on, but don't frequent as much, Truth, um, Gab, Getter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. I'm, I'm mostly on Twitter. I have my own sub stack. You can subscribe. It's free. Larry Swikart. I do about one or two articles a week there. So that's where you can get me. That's excellent. Well, everybody definitely go and check out uh, his work. So uh, so definitely just uh, keep that, uh, that play button going and uh, join us for the next episode. Thanks very much. <laughs>